President Ahmed Abdallah Sambi appeared in court Monday on charges of high treason. The French news agency AFP says the 64-year-old former leader and main op opponent to President Azali Asumani said he did not want to be tried by the court, the composition of which he says his lawyers say is illegal. The hearing will resume on Thursday. AFP says he has spent four years in detention. He was first placed under house arrest for disturbing public order and later detained for embezzlement, corruption and forgery, accused of selling passports to stateless people living in Gulf nations. He was later charged with high treason. Sambi led the Indian Ocean archipelago from 2006 until 2011. South Africa's constitutionalist court today ordered the release of a Polish immigrant who killed an anti-apartheid leader nearly 30 years ago and nearly plunged the country into civil war. In 1993, Janusz Wallace, now 69, killed at his home Chris Honey, a popular leader and general secretary of the Communist Party, as well as the chief of the staff of Mkoto Wesizwe, the armed wing of the African National Congress. The incident led to protests in black town townships as the country was negotiating the way forward to multi-race democracy. The French news agency AFP reported that Judge Raymond Zondo ordered the justice minister to place Wallace on parole within 10 days. Zondo says he was convicted of cold-blooded murder that led to civil unrest but has the legal right to parole. <laughs> On Sunday at the COP27 climate summit in Egypt, delegations ended marathon negotiations for a final statement and agreement. VOA correspondent Heather Murdoch is at the summit in Sham al-Sheikh. She told my colleague Kate Pound Dawson that developing countries, which suffer the most from climate change, despite contributing the least to the problem, have mixed reactions to the agreement. There are two main takeaways from the final agreement which happened at almost a day and a half after it was supposed to end. And the first was about carbon emissions. Um, there was no progress made uh, to reduce carbon emissions. And that was one of the main goals of the climate conference. The, they didn't backtrack on the Paris Agreement, um, which said they were trying to reduce emissions enough to keep the world's global temperatures rising to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels or at the most. So that goal, they maintained that goal, but they didn't do anything more to further it because right now the world's not on track to meet that goal. The other thing that did happen, which was um, much more promising, was the loss and damage fund was agreed upon. And this is an issue that developing countries from all over the world had come into the negotiations as a top priority with. There was a lot of pushback on this a lot of the wealthier nations did not want to have this kind of fund, were worried about unlimited liability, and had already pledged funding um, that was inadequate in other for other sources of funding for money to help developing countries recover from climate change disasters and prepare for climate change disasters, which um, it's usually the poorest and most vulnerable communities that are most uh, likely to suffer from climate change disasters. So that's why they wanted this fund. This fund was developed, um, but it's not also clear exactly when it will be funded and how the money will be dispersed. Do we know anything about when they're going to get those details on the fund, when it's going to be funded, how the money will be distributed, who's going to manage it? Or I think it's going to be a long time before those details are known. The first official meeting is scheduled for March 2023. And in that meeting, it'll be a preliminary uh, meeting to agree on logistics, on how to fund it and how to disperse the money. But they're still talking about at least a year or two years out before the funding becomes functional. And as you know, politically, especially when it comes to money, a lot can change during that amount of time. How has the statement and agreement coming out of COP27 been received, particularly by developing countries such as those on the African continent that, as you mentioned, are hardest hit by climate disasters? It's received mixed reviews. There was 
a tremendous amount of relief and and happiness that the loss and damage fund was agreed upon. This is something that people have been talking about for decades. So starting a track to right that wrong um, was a great achievement. And a lot of uh, representatives from developing countries were quite happy about this. Um, the worry about the funding was also there. And then there was also the fear of the fact that the emissions uh, were not cut. There was no, there was no promises and mechanisms developed to further cut emissions. In those same countries that are happy about a loss and damage fund to help deal with the more immediate crisis in recent years and surely in the years to come, um, are the same countries that are gonna suffer the most from global warming in the years to come. That was correspondent Heather Murdoch in Sham Al Sheikh in Egypt, speaking with VOA's Kate Pound Dawson. The East African Community Monday postponed a third round of peace talks between the Democratic Republic of Congo and rebel groups in Kenya's capital, Nairobi, saying conditions were not right. The talks by the seven-nation group are being held in parallel with peace talks in Angola involving the presidents of Burundi, the DRC, and Rwanda. Kinshasa has accused Kigali of supporting the M23 rebels in the DRC, which Rwanda denies. The resurgence of the rebel group M23 has threatened the peace in eastern DRC and displaced thousands in recent weeks. M23 is made up mainly of ethnic Tutsis and has accused the DRC government of failing to protect their families against rebel groups in the region led by ethnic Hutus. Recent actions by the U.S. government suggest that South Africa's banking and financial systems are being used to channel funding to terrorist organizations across the continent. Since March, the U.S. Treasury has imposed sanctions on several South Africans and their businesses. They are alleged to have given technical, financial or material support to the ISIS terror network. Darren Taylor reports. The Financial Action Task Force monitors how governments try to prevent money laundering and terrorist financing. The FATF says South Africa hasn't effectively identified, investigated or prosecuted terrorist financiers. Lakshmi Kumar is policy director at Global Financial Integrity, an anti-corruption group based in Washington, D.C., South Africa being such a significant economy in the region, it's a huge blot that it hasn't really made the progress that it should be making towards a strong beneficial ownership registry. She says these registries require public disclosure of the identity of individuals who benefit financially from companies, even if they're not legal owners. This ability to identify who owns a company, who's the natural person behind the company, is critical when you're trying to find people who've managed to smuggle away ill-gotten gains because it is always through a company structure of some sort, both domestically but also the ability to move that money outside South Africa to the rest of the world is facilitated primarily through anonymous companies. The World Bank says anonymous companies are used in the majority of corruption cases it reviews. It says beneficial owners hide behind shell companies and use complex money trails to move billions of dollars around the world. Late last week, Pretoria began rushing through legislation to establish a beneficial ownership registry. This after the FATF warned it could greylist South Africa, which would likely cost the country a lot in lost trade and investment. Kumar says the registry is essential to preventing money from flowing to terrorist organizations. But, says Kumar, even with them, Africa will continue to be particularly attractive to terrorist financiers because of the continent's extractive industries. The reason they lend themselves to being money laundered or being able to move is they are low weight, high value, and they are untraceable, and they are very dependent on a cash economy. Gold, diamonds, and a whole host of other minerals are perfect for illicit financial flows. 
One of the men the U.S. has identified as leading an ISIS cell in South Africa describes himself as a legitimate businessman involved in jewelry trading. Another is linked with a gold dealership. Extremist groups are burgeoning in Africa, and some use sophisticated equipment, so they must have a lot of money, says Kumar. Al-Shabaab is able to now pay close to a million dollars a month out to its fighters. We've seen that the bulk of the illicit finance coming from the continent is through the sale of commodities. She says large amounts of money are leaving South Africa to be laundered in countries with even weaker financial regulations, like Democratic Republic of Congo. DRC is an excellent example because with a country like DRC, you can move extractive commodities, as in you can move goods that are traded across the border. It's much harder to move financials as easily, simply because DRC is considered a high-risk financial country. According to international law enforcement agencies, terrorists smuggle gold and diamonds from DRC into neighboring countries like Uganda. The minerals are then mislabeled as being of Ugandan origin, which makes it much easier to sell them. The World Bank says only 21% of countries in sub-Saharan Africa have beneficial ownership registries. Kumar says some African political leaders don't want stronger financial regulations because they're benefiting from weak systems to stash laundered public money in foreign bank accounts and to invest ill-gotten gains in high-end international property markets. For VOA News, I'm Darren Taylor in Johannesburg. You're listening to Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. I'm Dimyake Mokalielie and I'm in Washington. Reuters News reports preliminary results released by Equatorial Guinea's government today show the ruling party winning more than 99% of votes counted so far in presidential, legislative and municipal elections held on Sunday. The tiny oil-producing Central African state is run by President Teodoro Obiang, the world's longest ruling head of state, who is seeking to extend his 43 years in office. Two opposition candidates are standing, Biono Ventura Monsiu Asumu, who has run in five previous elections, and Andre Esono Ondo, who is running for the first time. Early partial results showed Obiang's ruling Democratic Party of Equatorial Guinea and his coalition with 67,012 votes out of 67,196 counted so far. More than 400,000 people registered to vote in the country of about 1.5 million. Well, the World Cup has finally kicked off and we have the one and only Sonny Young of the Sunny Side of Sports live to give us an update on the play so far. Welcome, Sonny Young. Sporty World Cup. Greetings, Dimiak. Uh, African champion Senegal in action on Monday at the World Cup. Uh, I guess it's kind of a cruel result for the Lions of Taranga. They they lost to the Netherlands by a score of 2-0. I will say it it really looked like the match was headed for a scoreless draw. Uh, It was was late in the match when the Dutch uh, scored both of their goals. Uh, But up until that point, it was a tight, tactical match and it looked like Senegal would come away with one point but uh, I do have to give credit to the goal scorers for the Dutch uh, the first goal was was beautiful mm. by Cody Gakpo uh, who interestingly Demi has ties to Africa uh, his father was born in Togo and his mother is Dutch but Gakpo was on the receiving end of a beautiful, beautiful pass by Frankie De Bruyne in the 84th minute, and he knocked home a header to give the Netherlands a 1-0 lead. And then in extra time, uh, about nine minutes into extra time, Davy Klaassen uh, scored off a rebound for the, the second goal for the Netherlands. 
So final score from Doha at the Al Thumana Stadium, Netherlands 2, Senegal 0. Uh, I will say, Jimmy, uh, the Senegalese fans really seem to be out in force. Uh, especially behind Senegal's team bench, mm. singing, dancing, uh, cheering. Uh, and, and it really looked like they were going to lift Senegal, if not to victory, to, to a draw. But uh, I, I think there is some heartbreak on the, on the side of Senegal, Dimiaki. I can only imagine, Sonny. And so what happens now for the Taranga Lions? Where do they go from here? Well, I still think they have a very good chance of advancing Dimiaki. Uh Their next match on Friday will be against the host team, Qatar. And I, I think that's a winnable match for Senegal. Uh, Qatar was quite unimpressive in the World Cup's opening match on Sunday evening. They lost to Ecuador by a score of 2-0. And uh, the, the goaltender, especially for Qatar, looked very shaky. And, and I think Senegal can come away with some points on Friday. Uh, I, I think they will need probably a victory uh, to stay in the tournament. And I know they will be looking for three points. Uh, but but I, I do think Senegal definitely not out of this tournament. Uh, and, and, of course, they were playing without their inspirational captain, Sadio Mane, yes. who was ruled, ruled out of the World Cup because of injury. Uh, so right now, the Group A standings have the Netherlands with three points, Ecuador with three points, uh, Senegal and host Qatar with no points. Uh, in Monday's first match, Dibiaki, England looked very impressive. Mm. Uh, they won by a score of 6-2 over Iran, and another player with ties to Africa, Arsenal man, Bukayo Saka. Uh, he had a brace for Arsenal. Uh, his parents are from Nigeria, so I guess you could say the English uh, maybe maybe doing a little Africa rating, <laughs> but uh, the I will say the English look really impressive, Dimiaki. Uh, they, they, they dominated that match. Uh, the other scorers for England were Marcus Rashford, Grealish, and Bellingham, and as well as Raheem Sterling. Final score, England 6, Iran 2. So now England on top of Group B with three points. Uh, the second match in that group uh, will take place about 35 minutes from now. Uh, the USA will play Wales. USA has one of the youngest teams in the tournament, uh, along with Ghana. Uh, in, in fact, I think Ghana might have the youngest team, mm. averaging averaging about, uh, I think, about 24 years of age. Uh, the USA at about 24.5 uh, years of age. Uh, okay. That should be a very tight match, Timmy. It should uh, be a Wales, tight match. Led by their captain, Gareth Bale. Uh, who starred for many years in Europe. Uh, right. Wales is making its first World Cup appearance, believe it or not, Demi, in 64 years. Wow. Uh, last, last time they played in the World Cup was 1958. Uh, that one's kind of tight to call. Uh, uh, I guess since we are the voice of America, Demi, i got to go with the USA. I know you have. So, well, so hopefully, hopefully pick up three points, <laughs> but I think it will be a tight match. I, I, it looks like it. Well, one down, Senegal. We are waiting to hear now and see what happens with Cameroon, Tunisia, Ghana, and then tomorrow, Morocco, who will face Croatia. Thank you so much, Sonny Young. And now from Qatar, VOA's Kali Abdu and Sunday Shamari are going to give us a preview of tomorrow's match. Morocco plays Qatar. That's uh well let's go to the let's go to the match preview. Hello and uh, welcome. My name is Sunday Shamari. And I'm Kali Abdu. And uh, as we are in the Doha, Qatar, reviewing what's going to happen on Tuesday when the Atlas Lions of Africa, Morocco, will face the one and only. You know it. Croatia. I'm telling you, Kali, that's one of the I would say toughest games for the African team Morocco. Right. And I think this time around, Kali, you might tell me differently. I think Morocco is coming in with a whole different atmosphere, 
having one of the best full block in the world. Right, right. Hakimi, right. I think this is a, is a good thing for Morocco. Right, absolutely. I mean, uh, like you said, he's he's known to be one of the uh, best attacking fullbacks in the world. You know, Croatia have a lot to deal with. You know, oh yes, they have but, a lot of work to do. But uh, Croatia themselves uh -huh. have a lot of heavy hitters. I know. You know, they have a lot of heavy hitters, so I they know. they wouldn't be worried about him too much. Right. Um, they have a lot of big players that are used to playing against other big players, so uh, it'll be an interesting one to watch for sure. Absolutely. And maybe also this time, Kali, we are looking at one of the best Ballon d'Or winners right. in the squad. Right. Luka Modric. Right. Absolutely. And Modric, you see, now is 37 years old. Right. So this is the last walk. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean. Uh, what does that mean for the team? Um, it, it means that he's he's going to go all out. You know, he's one of the few players in the tournament who most likely are, are going to play for the last time in the World Cup. So it's going to be, you know, now or never, as they say, for people like Luka Modric. So I expect him to really go out guns blazing yeah. against uh, Morocco. Now, Morocco has been in the World Cup, this will be the sixth time. And uh, since they started 1986, they have never gone above the group stage. When I spoke to a lot of fans, in Qatar, all over coming from Morocco, they're saying this time or never. Right. <laughs> you see? Right. So it looks like they are very determined that this time around they, they should them. go past the group stage. But how are they going to make it? I'm looking at their squad, as you said, Croatia is tough, but also Morocco have people in Serie A. You got people in Premier League. Like the Chelsea fullback, right. Hakim Ziyech. Right. He's a winger. He's the winger. Sorry, yes. He's the winger. He's one of the best players too. You also have people like uh, Youssef Nesri. He's playing for Sevilla. Sevilla. Right. Right. I mean, these guys. They have a lot of experience. They have a lot of experienced players. They have a lot of experienced players. Players from Syria, uh -huh. uh, La Liga, like you mentioned. So. Right. They're, they're no slouches, you know. These guys are going to come in here and show show uh, some experience for sure. But, you know, compared to the experience uh, that the Croatians have, you have uh, uh, Brozovic uh, from Inter Milan, a really, really good player. Uh, you know Kovac is from Chelsea, excellent midfielder, who is going to be playing uh, alongside Luka Modric uh, in the middle of the park. These guys have played together in Madrid, as you know. Uh, so they're used to playing with each other. Right. You also have people like uh, Ivan Perisic, who plays in Tottenham, former Inter Milan player, really, really good, really good fullback, whether left or right. He can cross with left or right either way, and he he uh, he always gets across a dangerous cross in. So, hey, look, they, these guys have players from uh, Bundesliga, you know, uh, Stanisic from Bayern Munich. Uh, and so, so uh, many other players uh, that I haven't even mentioned, players across Europe. So these guys are really, really stuck. So Morocco have uh, their work cut out for them. Well, that was VOA's Kali Abdu and Sunday Shomari there giving us a preview of tomorrow's game between Morocco and Croatia. And that brings us to the end of our broadcast today. This is African News Tonight. I'm Dimiakim Okaliel Yehe in Washington on behalf of uh, Yehe Yaswahib saying... Good night, and please remember to, tune, to watch our website, voaafrica.com, for updates.